Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, the prophet of rage, the man with a face for radio and a voice for blogging, Mark Bigney. And with me, as always, is my loyal partner, the hype machine, the man with the body of a jock but the mind of a geek, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Always good. So we've got some good news, or bad news, case depending. It is the end of summer. Whether that's good or bad news is very much up to you, but as a result, we are now going to be abandoning our summer schedule, which is to say we will be reverting back to our uh, once-a-week timetable, and so you're going to be bothered by us every seven days rather than every 14 days. For that, you have our sincerest apologies. Also, we're going to need all your refunds back. So anyone we gave our mo- the money back to, we're going to, you can just, just, just send it back to us and we'll be fine. Exactly. It's only fair. Yeah, yeah. It's only reasonable. I mean, there's an unspoken contract here. So today we're going to talk about board games to honor the end of summer. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about our feature game this week, which is going to be The Voyages of Marco Polo. And then our topic this week is going to be Walker's Top 10. Now, on that topic, Walker's already shaking his head. Walker has some misgivings about this idea, which he will no doubt repeat in the fullness of time when it comes time to discuss the topic. I'd like to mention a little bit of feedback that I got from my top 10, just to sort of contextualize things. And I got this from people online. I got this from mutual friends of ours, which took the form of, oh, I guess you don't like game X. It's like, look, it is the nature of top 10s. We discussed this a bit last week, and this is one of Walker's primary misgivings to equate the unequal. My misgivings about top 10s, which I didn't voice at the time and really are out to have, is it can perhaps give you a sort of narrow view of someone's gaming tastes. And yes, my top 10 doesn't include lots of games that I absolutely adore because my top 10 consists of under 1% of the games that I've rated on Board Game Geek, for example. So for everyone who's like, oh, but I thought you liked Mage Knight, or oh, but I thought you liked Spirit Island, or oh, but I thought you liked... Yes, I love those games, but they're not in my top 10. And there are lots of activities that I enjoy absolutely that don't crack the top 1%. Some of them crack the top 2% or 3% or 4% or so forth. And yeah, I could list all of those, but then we would just spend all our time doing that. So that's all I have to say about that. If you're, if you're, if you're more interested in more specific views about other games we have, by all means, we can talk about that, but don't expect a top 10 to give a fullness of vision. And that's one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why we don't spend a lot of time on top 10 lists. Exactly. Cause they can give a, a sort of narrow perverse view of the whole. So, with that in mind, let us proceed to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play over the past couple of weeks? Well, I got to play Eclipse again. Everyone's played Eclipse, but it made me look forward to the second edition that's coming out. Everyone? Uh, everyone. I'm sure everyone's played Eclipse. Is that how it works? All the cool kids. Oh, okay. No, it, it just reminded me that it is quite a good game. It is balanced fairly good along all the players. It keeps you engaged the whole time. It has some very interesting mechanisms, and I think it just will benefit greatly from uh, Upgrade. Yeah, I haven't played Eclipse in a while. I'm not totally sold, as we've talked before, on the second edition. I'm actually uh, eagerly paying attention to the Eclipse 1.5 project online, where a number of stalwart Board Game Geek users are going to be producing paste-up stickers to bring your first edition components in line with the known second edition rule changes. You know, the, the minor balance changes about how this race needs more resources or this system is not good enough or what have you. Some of the rule changes you can already backport into first, first edition, and the ones that I like, I probably will be doing that. So I'm very much looking forward to that. The actual second edition itself... Eh, but uh, so suffice to say, I'm I'm looking forward to doing the sort of backdoor update at a cost of approaching zero dollars, rather than getting the second edition per se. What what race did you play when playing Eclipse last time? I played the pirates. Oh yeah, which you'd think would be you know extra good in fighting and and so forth. That didn't come around, but eventually <laughs> it got there. There was a great a great few turns where me and another player both tried to take on the neutral forces and got decimated. And, you know, to the repeat process in turns later, which was very funny. But other than that, I, it, I really enjoy it still. Yeah, the pirates are very high risk, high reward. So we played Dungeon Alliance. Dungeon Alliance is by Andrew Parks, who is the designer who did Core Worlds. And so I tried to give it as much chance as possible. I've played it across player counts. I've played it with people who knew what they were doing. And I really feel like I gave this game more chances than it deserved. Because Dungeon Alliance really, at the end of the day, I think is a misfire. Fundamentally in a number of ways. It tries to do some stuff with hand management insofar as on top of a dungeon crawl where you have your four different adventures, you have a a shared deck of cards that drive them, and so you have to decide, in theory, how to use the cards. But really, at the end of the day, you pegged it right after the first time you played. 
You look at your hand, you see who's well represented in your hand, you activate that hero. Then when it's time to activate another hero, you look at who's well represented there and go on and go forth. So in in a way, the hand management undercuts choices. It limits your options and makes the play more obvious rather than the other way around. And it's trying to emulate some of those hand management trade-offs of of card-driven games like Mage Knight, for example, but I really don't think it works very well. The information presentation is a bit of a hash. There are all these reference cards scattered all over the place. The general art design is throwback to about 20 years ago and not in a good way, I don't think. So really, I I had high hopes for Dungeon Alliance, but I'm pretty much done. I don't think I've got any more time for it. I think in many ways it's too much like uh, a dungeon crawl and not enough like some of the interesting things that it's trying to bring in. You know, it's got a little bit of deck building, a little bit of hand management, but really none of it works as it should, or none of it really serves to highlight novelty in the design, and it just feels a little overly procedural and tedious. Yeah, like you said, the only thing that that sets it out is this hand management thing that it tries to do. Other than that, it looks like a game that was locked in a time capsule for 15 years. Like the art, the other mechanisms other than the hand management, the miniatures, everything about it, the, you know, the chits on the board, the way you, you know, the strength versus all the combat, it just seems like a throwback to 15 years ago and was unimpressed. And just as a note, just as a, a, a counterpoint to the whole 15 years ago thing, it has some of the... I want to say design elements or at least market demands that characterize very recent games in a bad way, namely that every game has to be playable co-op, it has to be playable PvP, it also has to be playable solo, and every game has to work this way, whether it wants to or not. And that's one of the awkward things, again, comparing it to Mage Knight, one of the awkward things about Mage Knight is, well, it tries to involve all these different modes, and that's not really one of the best elements of the design. And again, Dungeon Alliance, because it wants to have all these modes, I I can't help but wonder, were some of these elements afterthoughts? None of them really seem to be an ideal version, and so you end up with a sort of muddled set of options, none of which really seem to sing. And I, I'm really I'm really getting tired of the sort of ubiquity of every game having all of those modes. Not not because I automatically think that it makes the game worse, but just because I know for a fact that design time and testing time is limited. And the more modes you put in, you know, by necessity, the less testing and design work is going to be going into each of them. And so I really think it's pandering to the market rather than than having a a designer's vision. Now, maybe that's just speculation on my part. Maybe I'm projecting, but Dungeon Alliance is very much par for the course in that in terms of recent pressures. And I I really don't like any of the modes introduced. And uh, yeah, I, I wish it worked. I, I, I wanted it to do well, but it uh, didn't do anything for me. And that was Dungeon Alliance. All right, I got, I got Outlive to the table again. Once again, I couldn't get Mark to play it. So I'm hoping one day to get his outlook on it. But that being said, I'm going to keep it for a little longer. But I think that its scoring mechanisms have a relative maximum. Because there you get points for all the survivors that you have left, but they can only go in so many rooms. So that's capped. The number of rooms is capped. Uh, The number of items that you can repair and get, you know, in six turns is semi-capped. So there's almost like a ceiling of a maximum score, roughly. So I think once you've played enough that you're hitting that mark almost every time, then it will lose its appeal. But until then, I still enjoy playing it. And that is Outlive. It's like post-apocalyptic. And its hook is that it has a really neat worker placement where you have different numbered workers. I already talked about this before, but let's go over it again, where you get action points depending on the number of worker you put on and you can pressure the other guys and force them to give you resources. And that part of the game is really interesting. And the overall theme is interesting, even though it's not represented in the game. That is Outlive. To give a shout out to a game that we went in depth on a few weeks ago, we played an excellent, excellent game of Food Chain Magnate. This was one of those games where it really served to highlight all of those major points of interest that you can tell players before the game starts, but sometimes they don't necessarily always come to fruition. What I mean by this is when we were setting up the game, the person to my left, who's a relatively experienced gamer, was saying, so what's the point of these reserve cards? And I said, well, people can control the length of the game. And once you know the game a little bit better, you can decide if you want it to be a short game or a long game. And this leads to different kinds of strategies. And he kind of shrugged in a way that says, whatever you say, I don't see it. And then I earned the CFO bonus. First to $100 gets the CFO, which is plus 50% of the revenue. And, and the same guy looked over and said, well, that seems kind of broken. I guess the game's over now. And I said, well, no, because this serves to offset the viability of more sort of slow burn strategies where suddenly 
you're earning a billion dollars every every round at the end of the game. This is for people who earn quick cash like I do. And so it serves to balance out those two different approaches. He says, eh, whatever, whatever you say. And sure enough, in the penultimate turn of the game, somebody sent forward a marketer who wandered into some sort of cosmic microphone, cleared her throat and gently said, <clears throat> beer. And suddenly everybody wanted beer and suddenly everyone wanted a billion beers. And she was the only person to sell them their billion beers. And she was charging them so much money for those beers. And it was perfect. It was, it, exi- it was like a textbook. This was her first play. And it was a textbook example of how to build a late game crushing combo to rake in the money. It was beautiful. I, I, I often enjoy getting trashed, but I particularly enjoy getting trashed by somebody doing something radically different from what I normally do and doing it so successfully and so smoothly. And really, it was one of those instances where in hindsight, hindsight I had to have known better when she was getting the luxuries manager, when she was getting all those marketeers, when she was getting those that incredible capacity to deliver beers by Zeppelin, which, by the way, is the only way to deliver beverage. And it was just a wonderful little game where it's just like, look, this is what the sandbox look like. it looks like. And you can see two extreme ends of, of, of the strategies, and both of them worked. It's just one of them worked a heck of a lot better. And so it was a, 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 it was a joy to see other people realize how the system works in Food Chain Magnate and exploit it so very, very well. It was a blast. I absolutely adored it. So rarely have I seen new players grasp uh, splatter games so fully and completely. Uh, it, it never surprises me when people grasp systems like that faster than I do, but that specific strategy of getting the luxuries manager to work and using crushing marketing to make sure that nobody else has anything that people want, it was just beautifully, beautifully done. And so that was a, it was a marvelous game, and I, I, I'll probably remember it for quite some time to yeah, come. It was great to talk everyone after it. Everyone loved it. I didn't, I didn't get to play in that game, but all the other players loved Food Chain Magnet, and there's no reason why they shouldn't because it is... Great to play, but impossible to win. <laughs> I finally got to finish an Imperial Assault campaign using the app, and it was great. I had no problems with it, even though we had a little, you know, tinkering around with the second to last mission. But the one thing I wish they had done, because you can see it when, when it starts randomly generating the bad guys in a room, and it cycles through all of your miniatures that you've put into the app. And I think it would have really benefited from sort of gr- makes, you know, only coming from groups to make it a little more thematic. Like, you know, in this particular thing, you're going to hit a bunch of bounty hunters or you're going to hit a bunch of stormtroopers instead of just completely random every time. It would have been, if they just had smaller subsets that they could draw from, I think it would have made more, way more sense and would, would have been uh, way more fun. But I am looking forward to the next campaign. More on that later. And that is Imperial Assault. Let me just ask you a question about that to follow up. So you mean to tell me that the app will will throw a Rancor and and Emperor Palpatine at you before it will send a second squad of Stormtroopers at you? Like it will cycle through everything in your collection once? No, I do believe there is categories. Okay. I think there are like... uh, here, like champions or villains, like main villains that it'll mm-hmm. cycle through, like Rancor, uh, Emperor Palpatine, Darth Vader. Like it'll cycle through those guys separately, and then it'll cycle through squads separately. I think it at least separates those. Okay, but I wish I had a different, even more subset type thing. I see. So then it will send a, a, another squad of of angry cannibalistic lizards at you before it will send a second squad of stormtroopers, regardless of where you are. Will it do that? No, it can be completely random. Okay. All right. Fair enough. You could get cats. You could get stormtroopers. You could get imperial robots. Anything that you've put in from your collection, if it says, you know, you're going to meet a squad in this room, then it's going to be a squad of a completely random type. Okay. I guess that's what it seems. Because, you know, you can see it generating and flipping through them, whether that's a real thing or not, or if it's just something, you know, to make it look as though it's doing a random thing. But you can see it cycling through them all randomly and then suddenly stopping and saying, here, throw these guys on the board. Doesn't sound super thematic. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If they had subsets, it would make it way cooler. So I got to try Blue Lagoon. I commented before that I was hopeful that Reiner Knizia might be back in the sense that he was designing games for me again. I had actually relatively modest expectations for Blue Lagoon because the early buzz was not particularly good. A lot of people have compared it to Through the Desert and very unfavorably at that. I think that the comparisons are overblown. They are both no luck tile lane games uh, where you know where positioning matters a great deal and trying to block people off. But other than that, 
I think they feel very, very, very different, and Blue Lagoon is interesting enough to stand by itself. I had a blast with Blue Lagoon. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it is some of his best work in years, and it has a a very interesting two-phase structure where first you place... Uh, people on rivers, and then you explore out from there. And then in the second half of the game, you basically wipe everything but your huts, and then you you spread out from huts. And they do actually feel very different in terms of how the pacing of the two halves goes. The scoring is a little bit more cumbersome. It's actually more point salady than than Knizia typically does. But the scoring actually really makes it work because there's a whole bunch of different priorities that you can be pursuing at any given time. And the people who succeed well are the ones who find ways to make several different priorities work together with a narrow set of placements. So with every tile they're placing, they're work, working towards several things, not just one thing. Uh, I It's quick. It's 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 very simple. It's hu- been hugely successful with everyone I've introduced it to. Blue Lagoon, I think, is an absolute winner. And if this is the kind of output that Knizia is going to be uh, continuing to put out, he's going to be putting out an expansion to quest for Eldorado soon. He's got a number of other things down the pipe. I still haven't tried Amun Ray the card game, which looks like it might have kept all the good th- the, the things from Amun Ray that I quite liked and gotten rid of some of the other stuff that I didn't that I didn't quite enjoy. Uh, I'm just I'm very, very happy to be playing new Rainer Knizia designs. And Blue Lagoon is cheap, it's cheerful, it's available now. I highly recommend it. Yeah, we played it several times this week. Everyone enjoyed it. And if you're trying to ramp up people in your group to heavier games, this is the one to get for sure. It, it has all the aspects of, of you know, this taking away, controlling the board, not doing certain moves because you know they're locked down, doing things that are important right away. And it will definitely migrate people into these heavier games that you want them to play. That's Blue Lagoon. What did I get? Let's talk about it. I have a huge list. I'm not even going to list them all. I'm just pick cherry picking ones like Mechs versus Minions. Here's a game that I thought that there could never be a bad game, that it was always fun. We brought it to the table the other night, and it was painful at times. It was one of the end missions, almost, near the end. I think it was number eight or so. Of, yes, I believe so. Of how many? How many is the total? I think ten. Eight of ten. Anyway, it was this mechanism where you had to go through all these gates, but in order to get through the gates, you had to hit these other runes, and it was all tight, and there was hardly nothing to do, and it was just... Uh, pain to get. I prefer in programming games like that where if you make a mistake or something goes wrong, something fun happens. Instead of everyone being in a very narrow corridor with a whole bunch of gates that won't open. And so as a result, a lot of our turns, both at the beginning of the game and in the later half of the game, where it's like, I bump against this wall five times and do nothing. And sure, maybe we should get good, but I prefer in games where even if you're not good, even while you're failing, something fun is happening, or at least something mildly interesting. In the other scenarios of Mechs versus Minions, they're, the space is more wide open, and so yeah, you can go off and do the wrong thing, but at least something is happening. You're getting feedback, and it's not just turn after turn of literally bashing your head against a stone wall. And it is hilarious most of the times. Like I always have the scenario in my head where it's this you know mad science called Heimerdinger, and he's flipping around with one leg, you know, firing sparks off because it's you know malfunctioning he's doing pirouettes with his flamers going randomly killing killing uh minions and then there's like that slow motion episode where he looks over at you and then sort of gives you like the point and wink because he he, you know doesn't know what's going on but he loves the madness and and the death ensues and it's just a fantastic game other than the one game of 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 dozens that we've played that all have been fun that's mechs versus minions it also really highlighted how awkward the rules presentation is. Because in order to find the rules for various things, you had to look through past scenario rules that were in sealed envelopes, or at least, you know, manila envelopes that had been unsealed, but you have to go fish through them and it made it a lot more complicated than it needed to be. It didn't have it didn't have stickers like other quote unquote campaign games yes. where you can just slap them in the rule book and find out what's going on. We talked about this before. The game is practically flawless, really. Like with the the inserts, the the fact that the, mi- the miniatures go in any slot, they're all shaded. The paint jobs on the ones that are painted are fantastic, except they really just dropped the ball in the rule book. They had this very interesting, like there's nothing wrong with the campaign system. It's great to be there. Everything's there, but they should have had just a, a generic rule book. Like we want to take out the game and have a game. This is how you do it. Put out these certain map sections, run this scenario, this is all the rules and done except of you know fishing through eight different envelopes trying to find the rules for this particular you know setup that you have everything's got to have a campaign everything's got to have a campaign 
Got to play Ghost Blitz. This is a game I played before. This is by Jacques Zimet, the same guy who did Cockroach Poker, and we're big fans of a lot of his work. Ghost Blitz is kind of like jungle speed, but more calibrated to my tastes. Games like this are about visual recognition and then manual dexterity to grab something. But I find the uh, visual recognition of some games of jungle speed to be just a little bit more complicated than I'd like. Ghost Blitz still has hilarious errors of people mistakenly grabbing the wrong thing or what have you. But Ghost Blitz also has the additional benefit of, of being, you know, just tailored to my level of visual acuity. Uh, it's also much more cute. It's got these lovely, lovely pieces that are just very, very adorable. It's also a lot cheaper than Jungle Speed, which is surprising given the Jungle Speed is relatively inexpensive to begin with. And it's over quickly. Everyone can play. It's a great little... Uh, large player count filler party game, which we're always on the lookout for and we're huge fans of. And Ghost Blitz, I find very, very, very fun. The only problem I have is that I think I got a couple of lacerations on the back of my hand from people with longer nails than me diving for the same objects. So uh, keep that in mind. Fantastic game. Brought it all through Europe. Played great in the hostels because it's non-language dependent. You just sort of, even if it, if people do need rules, it's like one of these games that has, you know, seven different languages in the box. And it's a great, you know, icebreaker in people that you don't know or, you know, people who've never played games before. It is it is a fantastic game, especially for children as well, because it's it's... I introduced it to several children and who have never played any type of board games or anything before, and that's all they asked for for the rest of the day. When are we playing Ghost Blitz again? Fantastic. Just as, as a fair warning, though, uh, don't use Walker's tactic when playing with children of pushing them away from the table so as to grab the necessary object. This uh, It's apt to be misconstrued. Look, in the I'm back saying. of the book, it says the cupcake fake is allowed, so I get to use that. I'm not going to stop doing that. Yeah, but you wrote that in in crayon. I don't think that comes in the published version. Lies. I got to play, what was I going to talk about? We both played. I want to talk about this one. King Domino Giants. And that is to say that I think we both come under the same realization is that there's games, just because it sort of fences into Ghost Blitz here, where there's a, a mechanism in a game that's basic and it's great because that's all it is. And there's nuances in that game, like Cockroach Poker and King Domino. And when you when a game becomes popular, they try to tack on these extra systems that just bog down the nuances that make these games great. And I think Giants does that. I can't. I, I, have, I haven't played Giants. I don't know what you're talking Were about. Were you not in that game? No. I could have sworn. Or maybe you just looked at it quickly. And oh, I've seen the adorable it. pieces. I love that little magnetic clasp tower thing that holds all the, all the tiles, but I haven't played it. Oh, sorry about that. I thought it was you and I that talked about it. But anyway, the person that I talked about it with, had we came under the same realization that it's just... It's, it doesn't, it's fun. It's great. You know, people who, who play King Domino a lot, probably like, you know, the different strategies or, you know, different mechanisms. But I think, like I said, it just adds a layer of complexity, not huge complexity, but what makes King Domino great is just how it flows and how basic it is. And that's the expansion to King Domino Giants. Got to play a game called Cult of the Cockroach King. This is a game about post-apocalyptic restaurant inspectors who are trying to undo the work of the Cockroach King by pr methodically stomping on all his vermin allies. You may think this is a terrible theme for a game, but uh, if so, that's because you're just wrong, because it's my game. Uh, it, strictly speaking, the game is Don't Mess With Cthulhu, but nobody in our circles has a copy or was able to get a copy, so I cobbled together... Uh, I proxied a copy with bits from Cockroach Poker and uh, just the Allegiance cards from the Resistance. So I had to come up with a theme for it. And so we call it the Cult of the Cockroach King. But anyway, Don't Mess with Cthulhu is a sort of very, very light, simple social deduction thing. It was suggested in part so as to try to bridge the gap between the vast majority of secret Hitler partisans and the very, very small number of cognoscenti who recognize that the Resistance is a billion times better, roughly, more or less. You know, maybe it's more like 999,000 million. But anyway, um, so Don't Mess With Cthulhu is, uh, I mean, it's quick. It's also pretty random. Um, not a whole lot of social deduction going on. I mean, it's pretty inoffensive, but there's not much there. For something of that level, if you want the bluffing, again, I'd probably go with something like Cockroach Poker or Skull. And if I actually want social deduction, I'd probably play something with actual social deduction. It's about picking cards in front of people, but the people don't know where the, the cards are. So there's an element of, of risk-taking, even if everyone's telling the truth, which kind of helps things a bit, I suppose. So it's Ultimate Werewolf. Uh, no, it's not as bad as that. I wouldn't... 
I was afraid when I read the rules and I saw that there was a certain amount of, of shuffling and so people didn't know what was where that it would be too much like the one day uh, or one night games. But it, it's not that bad. It's more a question of trying to suss out where certain cards are. And that's a little bit difficult. And some of it is about deduction, about who knows what and where. But mostly you can only tell that someone's lying if they claim to have something that you know for a fact that you already have. Uh, past that, I didn't really see a whole lot of depth or nuance. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try it again, but I didn't really see much there. We and should we should track how many games we proxy with Cockroach Poker. Because <laughs> we use it for Skull, we've used it for this Cthulhu game, yes. we've used it for... Anyway, it'd be interesting to see the, the number of plays that are not Cockroach Poker with Cockroach Poker. Absolutely. The last one I'm going to talk about hopefully very briefly, is Root. And the only com- the only comment I want to make is I, I'm quickly associated with, what was the game called, 504, the one where you had, like, you could, you know, mock together all your different games and all, and there's, it's sort of like that. It's like, are you going to have a new player? What races are you going to play with? <laughs> you know, and, you know, all these different factors and it's all going to, you know, spit out a certain kind of game at the end. You know what I mean? And, and I'm wondering if, it, are you sort of getting that feeling now as well? No more than we initially had. I mean, the, the asymmetry is so huge and what factions you decide to play are significant, significantly uh, strong. Now, the last game we played was thrown off by a number of factors. Now, we mentioned uh, in our review when going in depth that the game is a little bit fragile if people aren't playing, quote unquote, correctly. And this isn't to encourage metagaming or kingmaking or anything like that, but just everyone has to have a certain intuitive sense of what their role is and how to constrain the other factions. And honestly, almost everyone I've shown this to immediately takes to it. They're like, well, I guess I have to have to go stomp on him now. And it's like, yep, that's your job. That That's what has to happen. If somebody gets uh, doggedly convinced that they want to do something specific just because, then yeah, the game's going to get thrown off. If somebody gets incredibly preternaturally unfortunate in card draws, like really, really badly, uh, then the game is going to get thrown off. So yeah, the game state is a little bit fragile. It's not super fragile. But if people aren't willing to play the sort of keeping everyone in check game, then yeah, things things might get a bit weird. Next game I want to talk about is DC Spyfall. And this is just briefly, this is the themed version of Spyfall that was released by Cryptozoic. Again, uncredited, bad call Cryptozoic. Uh, you know, there, there are credits for the original designers of Spyfall, but, you know, I, I wish they give credit to whoever elaborates on the design because sometimes that's as interesting as, as who does the original design. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Spyfall because I think for a game of that type, maybe a large player count party-ish with elements of play acting and or social deduction quick thinking... It's very tense in a bad way because only one person is ever talking at a time. And so it feels very stressful. Everyone's sitting there waiting for you to speak and everyone's just watching the one player. I would rather, much rather have a raucous game where anyone can speak at any time. And yeah, some people, like for example, Walker, don't feel comfortable inserting themselves into a large, loud conversation. And so then they get shoved to the side. But uh, generally speaking, I think a worse way to introduce people who are ill-inclined to speak is to sit them down and say, okay, it's your turn to speak now. Have 11 pairs of eyeballs staring at you waiting for you to make the next move. That's not well, particularly... That's part of it. That's the stress of Spyfall. Yeah, I, I don't I don't find that stress to be very good. And as a result, it's a game where uh, oftentimes it's just silence. It's just stressed silence while someone's thinking of what to say. In other games of that nature, if you're trying to, you know, trying to suss out what's going on, it's someone else's turn or someone else could have something to say or someone else could contribute the game proceeds. So that, that that's one of my beefs with Spyfall. DC Spyfall adds to the formula by giving people quote-unquote special powers, some of which are not special powers. One of them is you can only speak in sentences of three words or less. You know, your answers all have to be three words or less, which seems like a big punch in the face. It means that you have to spend an extra amount of care in formulating your answers and you're going to look suspicious anyway because you're not talking very much. So I'm not a huge fan of that. It's also got some other weird modules. Anyway, I'm not a huge fan of Spyfall and I don't think that the DC Spyfall elaborates on it very well. It's also not very accessible. Like one of the locations in DC Spyfall is Mogo, which apparently is a living planet who's a member of the Green Lantern Corps. Great. True. Some we, of them are, are odd, right? Just because you have to have so many and it's DC. And, yeah. But they do have an interesting one like the Fortress of Solitude and, you know, which a Arkham lot of, Asylum. Which a and, lot of people aren't going to know about. Any, anyway, like, look, I don't read DC Comics, but I know what the Fortress of Solitude is. But And maybe Arkham Asylum could be counted as general knowledge. But Mogo, seriously? Or you have to be reminded, okay, this is the city where the Flash lives. What, what's, what's that city called? Liberty City or something? True, but it could be much like the, the Codenames... Avenger, what is it, Codenames DC or Codenames 
I think it's Marvel, Marvel and I, I haven't played that one I'm either. I'm just saying, either. I think it's just for it's for that niche market. Sure. The people that you know are going to be into it, that know the history and, and everything about it. There you it. go, blaming the victim. Exactly. It's my fault for trying it. That's what you get. Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, the last game I'd like to talk about is Civilization. Not Sid Meier's Civilization, not Civilization in New Dawn, not Through the Ages a Story of Civilization, but Civilization. The one that predates Sid Meier, the one that was published first in 1980 by Francis Tresham. I am a big fan of Civilization. It's one of those games that I think has aged incredibly well. It captures a lot of what I think all the other Civilization games don't do. I've talked about this before. I am getting increasingly tired of the fact that Civilization games all seem to boil down to, uh, you know, Genghis Khan commanding a tank battalion to conquer the pyramids or whatever. It's just this mishmash of, oh, you know, the Hanging Gardens are over here, and okay, here you have a space program, and here you have an air force, and over there you've got a phalanx. It's like, okay, fine, whatever. But in Civilization, what you actually get is sort of the broad sweep Your civilization starts out as a single nomadic tribe. It can rise to a mighty empire. It can be laid low by the effect of an epidemic or piracy or some other calamity. It then has a couple of turns where it it struggles to regain its footing, and then it flourishes again. You get a genuine sense of ebb and flow, all of which is played out in a competitive game that, although not particularly smooth, is still very accessible. I mean, Walker very... uh, very astutely, I think, and it does him credit. He he very much identifies games in terms of flow, about how well they flow in terms of the structure. Civilization has no flow, zero flow. It has negative flow. But it nonetheless manages to be very, very simple in most of its mechanisms. The most complicated thing that that you have to worry about in Civilization is just figuring out how the trade phase works and how to cash things in for, for value. But I've I've been a huge fan of Civilization. I don't tend to play the full version. I tend to play one of the shorter games, which is eminently playable in an afternoon. You're talking about three, four hours. Its length has been exaggerated. I'm not a fan of advanced civilization. Uh, this puts me somewhat in the minority. This is, again, the sort of doctrinal conflict of Secret Hitler versus the Resistance. I, I think that advanced civilization, very much like the what Walker said of the Giants' expansion of King Domino, these are people that liked the game but didn't understand it and decided to try to make it into something that it wasn't and make a whole bunch of changes without realizing why Tresham did what he did. Francis Tresham, for context, is the same guy who invented the 18xx form and who invented the Civilization game as we understand it. This is a guy who is who who you know you should respect his intuitions to say uh, uh, to put it very mildly. And I really do think that when it comes to civilization games, it is peerless in how it represents a lot of these things. I love it mechanically. I love it thematically. I love it for the sweep. It's a marvelous, marvelous game. And we played it on the new Gibson's printing. This is a a small English publisher that put on a new edition. I have some misgivings about the new edition. The board's a little garish, although it's very easy to identify starting areas and so forth. But they didn't include the Western expansion map, which is a very uh, key design element for a lot of higher player count games. They didn't bother to include any of the other optional modules, even though I'm not a huge fan of those other ones. But anyway, I think there were a number of missed opportunities. There's no they could have included the effects of civilization cards on the civilization cards and they didn't do that. The fact that everything's single sided printed. Everything is single sided printed with the exception of the trade cards that do actually have backs on them. Yeah, it, it, it's weird. They they made a number of strange design choices when they had the opportunity. So in many ways if you've got one of those old Avalon Hill cards Copies, you still have the best copy available. And it, it, just as a, as a side note, again, about my fondness for Avalon Hill games, I've got a bunch in my collection, and I don't play them nearly often enough, mostly because I'm surrounded by people who take, who take a look at dated box covers and assume that the game is terrible. Mentioning no one in particular, certainly nobody named Michael Walker. But we're talking about 30, 40-year-old games that had no typos in them. Many of them. Some of them did, of course. They're, you know, there are Avalon Hill games with typos in them. But we're talking about games that stood the test of time. This is a game that was published in 1980, and it's still the definitive edition. The Avalon Hill edition is still the definitive edition with no typos in it at all. Which, you know, compare that to almost any other production now. Whether it's the speeded production, whether it's the fact that Avalon Hill had more staff, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm not in a position to comment. But... Uh, sometimes when people talk about the cult of the old or, or the pull of nostalgia, I'm a little bit sympathetic because when you're talking about those great Avalon Hill games, Civilization, the original Merchant of Venus, forget the Fantasy Flight Edition, uh, talking about things, other Hamblin stuff like Gunslinger or Magic Realm, these really, really past masters of design, the, the things that people are still coming back to 30 years later, I was very glad to get Civilization at the table and it was a great time. I enjoyed it a great deal. I'm looking forward to playing it again. 
it was great as long as you make sure you tell everyone that everyone's going to get really screwed by the calamities. The calamities, as long as they understand that it's going to affect everybody and everyone's going to get completely devastated. And so they're ready for it. I think it will be a great experience for everyone. That's the great thing. Uh, just again, to give a specific instance of this whole sort of scope and ebb of flow. At various times in civilization, you need your population to do various things. There are going to be times when you have excess population, and you need to know what to do with them. And that's one of the challenges of managing a big, sprawling civilization as opposed to a young, struggling one. And a big, sprawling one, you have to know, when can I send these people to die in a fight? Because you don't have room for them, so there has to be something. Again, population pressure is driving expansion, which is also very satisfyingly thematic. You have to know, when do I need these people to just starve to death because I have no other place to put them? Sometimes that's also a viable recourse. And and or where can I stash these guys to worry about the fact that I'm going to lose cities because calamities are going to whack me inevitably? You're inevitably going to get hit by calamities. And when you first read the effects, everyone at the table who hasn't played before is going to say, well, that's it. They're out of the game. That's done. And you're not. It's about being able to come back from these challenges and anticipate them. Anyway, I adore civilization. The, the, the ebb and flow of it is so beautiful. And I'm looking forward to getting it to the table again. And that's what we played this week. So let's move on to the news and why it doesn't matter. I will just characterize generally the news that I see. There's not a whole lot of news coming out. We're in the post-Gen Con lull. And for somebody who didn't go to Gen Con, this is in many ways my, one of my favorite times of the year. Because there's no news of anything, but we're getting all our games. All the Kickstarter projects, they rushed in that final sprint so they could bring Kickstarter copies to sell at Gen Con. They're showing up in backers' hands. All the, P all the companies that came back from the con now have time to ship out orders. So we're getting lots and lots of new stuff all the time. And, I'm, and I finally get to play all the stuff that I've been reading about for a while. So that's one of the reasons why we've been playing so many games. It's one of the reasons why we've got so many games coming in. Uh, so really, I, I think honestly, as far as board gaming is concerned, the post gen con sort of September, October is Christmas. True. But in a quick, quaint query, WizKids is releasing Quarriers, the quid ultimate quidition. <laughs> now, let me quash your quacking quibbles. <laughs> For I'm sure that a quarter of you want to quit this queer quandary before we start to quarrel. Let me quiet your quips and quantify this quality of a game before you get queasy. It is the queen of quarterbacking and a, a quagmire in the quiver category. <clears throat> I have a query. Yes, sir. What the hell did any of that mean? It means that once again, I get to slide in at the last minute and get a complete edition of a game <laughs> without having to worry about having all the editions, everything else. It's sad for the people who have bought a bunch of it already, but for those people who have nothing, it's a great way to get the whole package all at once. Have you played? Uh, I have. Yeah, Couriers. It's yeah. it's it's not the best game of all time, but it's a very interesting like bag building system where you're you know fighting monsters and building your bag up by purchasing more monsters and it's it's neat to have. It's like that one. It's it's nice to have on the on the stand. Bring it out that once or twice a year. I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I had it when I had it when it first came out. It struck me as uh, cute. I liked it. I liked it far more than I thought I should. Right, because it does a number of the things that more slickly designed deck builders have done very well. It doesn't do. And, you know, the economy was a bit wonky. I thought that the timing was was strange. Uh, the the die rolling was often a little too deterministic because you actually have to roll a creature value in order for it to become a creature. Otherwise, it's just going to be something that's right. And the un unsatisfying. The downtime if you have a large player count is awful. Yeah, so yeah. It's three or less, I'm sure, but. But yeah, you know, I will say this: based on your uh, implied declaration that you'll be getting the the uh, the all in edition, uh, I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll be happy to to see it enter rotation again. There you go. Do you have any news, or is it just your post Gen Con no news? No. Well, we have additional details on the Norwegians expansion for Feast for Odin. Uh, in addition to having new colony boards, which we've already seen, there was the mini expansion for Feast for Odin that had new colonies. It's going to have yet more colonies. It's going to have starting buildings. It's going to have new goods, new shapes of goods. It's going to have new animals. It seems like it's going to have lots of everything and not just the simple stuff. Because again, new islands, new professions would be very, very easy to do. But they really seem to be going whole hog on this edition and uh, expanding it in, in genuine ways. So who, who knows? This might be a case of overcooking things because it is already the case that in Feast for Odin, there's already so much that you can do. And if they just multiply that 
freedom of action too far. It could be tipping things over the limit. Uh, so I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic, but it looks like it's going to be available in time for uh, the Spiel at Essen in October. So we're probably going to see it sometime in November, December, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to seeing that. Nice. My other point of news is that uh, Jabba's Realm, the, another digital campaign for Legends of the Alliance, which is the Imperial Salt campaign. Since we just finished the other one, the other thing I was thinking about though is that. When the when the app came out, you had your tutorial mission, and then you had this, you know, flight of the Freedom Fighter or something. But that's all they've had. It's been ten months now, really, since they put out another campaign. Huh. And that's you know, it's it's great for me because I've played all sorts of other games, and I haven't really you know, have been, you? I haven't been really waiting for for but for those people who you know played a lot, they were probably awfully sick of that first campaign mission. Sure. But 10 months later, now we have Jabba's Realm. So looking forward to that. So is this, I guess since there's only been the one release, there's not really enough data to to pull a pattern. But I seem to recall that the Jabba expansion in the physical version of the game hit about nine months ago or so. So maybe that's just the lag that it's going to be. You know, every nine months or so they put out a new wave and then another... Sorry, they put out a wave, and then about nine months or so afterwards, they include the campaign that that duplicates that. True, but there was huge numbers of of campaigns that they could have done that came out way before Jabba's that's good Realm, point. right? That's a good point. So that's all the news that we've got. And I've got one more. Oh, well, I, sorry. I've got, Go uh, this 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 uh, Oblivion conspiracy, I think, <laughs> is much deeper than we thought. They've got FedEx FedEx in on on it now. Yeah, we're even getting like legit emails from FedEx implying that this oblivion is coming and the number of fake, you know, uh, messages on board saying that people have got their fictitious copy of this game. I I didn't think they'd go through so much trouble. Here's the way I think it works. There's the Nigerian print scam, right? There's the Canadian revenue agency needs you to send them iTunes gift cards scam. There's uh, boner pills through the mail. And then there's sentinels of the multiverse oblivion. Those are the, those are now the big top four scams uh, it's a myth. The game doesn't exist. It's tr- they've, the fact that they've gotten their tendrils into FedEx to send us these fake messages that that even were so plausible as to recognize that they you know they give us shipping notifications that mention that they'll be skipping Labor Day. I mean, it, it truly is devious. Yeah, they went the whole gambit. Yeah, yeah, congratulations. They've kept the scam up for so long. They figured we can't pull Chinese New Year again, so now it's time to to get to this. Yeah. And well, yeah. something else, very quickly. I'm not going to do media news all the time, but this is sort of built up. I kept forgetting to mention it. So just three quick notes. There's the Scythe uh, video, uh, computer game out. I've played it multiple times. You want Scythe game in 15 minutes. This is the way to do it. And there's a fantastic diplomacy website that you can go to that you can play diplomacy online. There's a great interactive map. It's called, you go to Backstabber and you and your friends can rekindle what forged your fantastic friendship in the first place. (laughs) This is Backstabber without an E, correct? If you put in Diplomacy Backstabber website, I'm sure it will come up on the Googles. And if you just search for Diplomacy Backstabber, you'll find a picture of you. (laughs) More than likely. Actually, one more bit of news. I talked last time about my incredible, sincere, and undying love and devotion for Lupin Louie. My understanding is that there is a new printing of the game that is a Target exclusive, and apparently the engineering has been altered such that it is a bit faster than previous versions. Now, I haven't tested this yet. I'm going to have to make a pilgrimage down to the United States sometime in the near future so as to procure my own copy and do the comparisons, because one of the great things about Lupin Louie is that you can compare set to set, edition to edition, even copy to copy, to see which version of the engineering you prefer. Because the subtleties of the various shots are altered considerably in all these instantiations. And if you're an aficionado, or at least a follower like I am, just paying attention to these differences is very enjoyable. That's really going to mix up the tournament scene. Well, I mean, the tournament rules, such as they are, have been solidified for a great time, thanks to the disciples of uh, Rob Cedar and Nathan Dilday. Long may they loop. Uh, but the actual tournament scene as such is woefully lacking, mostly because uh, some incredibly full-of-themselves adults think they're too good for, for a kid's toy. So uh, let them suffer. So that's the news and why it doesn't matter. Onward to our feature game, which this week is going to be The Voyages of Marco Polo. This is a game by, and I do not know how to pronounce Italian, Simone Luciani and Danielle Tashini. This was put up by Hands in Gluck a few years ago in 2015. 
And this is a dice placement game. Namely, you don't have workers to place, you instead have dice. And the values in those dice will influence where and how you can place them. So this design team in particular, uh, Danielle Tashini does not have a design pedigree as long as Simone Luciani, but one thing they did together was Tzolkin, the Mayan calendar, which I've tried, and they also put out Council of Four, which I haven't. Tolkien is a worker placement game with a sort of physical gimmick of grinding gears. It's very, very popular in a lot of circles, and it's it got a lot of buzz when it got released. This was released before uh, the Voyages of Marco Polo, but Marco Polo is their more recent design. And uh, Walker, why don't you give us a rundown of what one does in the Voyages of Marco Polo? All right, in Marco Polo, after you set up the whole board, you're going to analyze the board because this is a game where it changes every time and it really makes a difference on the layout of the board on how you're going to play. So you're analyzing the board, figuring out with your unique player ability, that is amazing, what is the best route to take across the map and what's the best way to get an early jump on those free resources. Then, once the game starts, you're eagerly trying to get money and then you say, crap, that guy just took the money space that I needed. Maybe next turn I'll be able to get the money and then you say, oh wait, but the game's over and then you add up your points and that is (laughs) Marco Polo. (laughs) All right, so let's... (laughs) <laughs> I'd like to talk about the dice first because I like it when Euro games use dice in a clever way, and they often do. And the first dice placement game I ever played was a game called Kingsburg. And this is where it was a slightly more traditional worker placement element in that if you place your dice somewhere, they add up to a certain value. You know, you've got a three and a four, you slot them down in the seven, you do the thing of the seven space, and then nobody else can take the seven space. Marco Polo is a little bit more sophisticated than that in that most spaces you can go to where someone else has already been you just have to pay for it and you mentioned right off the top i think very relevantly that money is a huge deal in marco polo you never ever ever have enough it's absurdly expensive to do almost everything and that's one of the key constraints of the game but because and i'll oversimplify things here lower roles are less expensive to place broadly speaking High rolls aren't necessarily better. There's always a tension between what you want to use low rolls with and what you want to use high rolls with. I'm not saying that what you roll doesn't matter and that every round when you roll, you're going to have a, you know, a quote unquote fair distribution and be able to do whatever you want to do with it. But it is very much the case that if somebody rolls five sixes at the start of their turn, the appropriate response is not Yahtzee, but rather I'm not going to be able to afford to do anything because they won't have the money to use them. Uh, similarly, if somebody rolls five ones, they're not going to be thrilled, but at least they're going to be afford be able to afford everything that they're able to do. Not that either of these is, is perhaps, perhaps likely. So, you know, broadly speaking, I'm always in favor of a game that uses dice in such a way that you're going to be able to moder- moderate these results. And I think that Marco Polo does a good job of that. All right, let me go into some more of the rules of the game so you can sort of understand what we're talking about. So the ways to get points are so these contracts. You get one at the beginning, and it's... Literally, like the usual, you're going to get these resources. Once you have the right resources to fulfill the contract, as a free action, you just say, yeah, I have enough stuff. You give it back to the bank, and you're either going to get a mix of victory points or money or another Benny of some kind. Then there's the trading houses. Every time you end your movement at a certain space uh, on the spaces of the map, you're going to put one of your trading houses out. And if you get them all out, you're going to get a bunch of points at the end or depending where you put them, maybe at the far end of the board, you're going to get some points or over on the sideboard, you're going to get points. So putting out trading houses also gets you points. And then there's certain spaces on the board that you can place your dice as an action that will generate you points, i.e. trade in this many resources, get this many victory points. So those are the main three ways you're going to get victory points. And that collates to the three main spaces on the map. There's the start of round bonus spaces. You put your trading house in there, and at the beginning of every turn, you're going to get some sort of bonus of some kind, be it money or resources. Then there's the extra action spaces, which are going to give you more places to put dice. As long as you have a trading house there, you are the person that can take that action, and only one person can. And then there's all the other spaces, which are mostly victory point spaces. You know, be the first in, get a huge amount, or get points there. And those are the spaces of Marco Polo. So you've touched on pretty much all the elements of the game. And this is one thing I'd like to stress right away. Lots of Euro games that are middleweight or heavier 
they really do have lots and lots of different little details and little elements that can slot in with each other. But one of the things that I really like about the voyages of Marco Polo is how tightly they all fit together. So you talked about, for example, the spaces that you can place on the board after you put a trading house there. Broadly speaking, this is, so this is emphatically not a tableau builder. You don't generate large quantities of income. You don't generate large quantities of cards that you activate every round. Instead, what you do is as you travel and, and, and open up more of the board, your placement options multiply. And that can be a core part of how you get points, try to you know generate the, the resources necessary to churn them into those spots on the board, or not, case depending. And indeed, although it's crucial that you go out and put these trading houses on, on various places to get this income, again, Income is never going to be your primary source of revenue, which dovetails with one of the things that I, uh, another thing that I really wanted to stress. It's that for a game with this much stuff, there's very good flow. Again, I, I'm really coming around to your way of looking at things about how, how flow is very important. And despite the fact that there's tons of little details on the board, the flow is very simple. At the end of a round, after everyone's placed all their dice and therefore everyone's taken all their actions, you basically wipe one area of tiles put out five new tiles, you get income, which is usually not a huge deal, and that's it. You're off to the races. You're off to the next round. As opposed to other other games that I very much like that have worker placement elements, compare this to, say, Agricola, right? Which every round, everything screeches to a halt, where you have to refill a whole bunch of spaces and reveal new cards and stuff. The Voyages of Marco Polo evolves much more organically, precisely because as you open up more of the board, you get more spaces available, some of them being very, very powerful. And as you say, if at the start of the game you, with foresight, looked and said, I need to get to this space, and by rounds three, four, and five, I need to be pumping this space really hard, it can be very satisfying to pull that off. Yeah, just to add to what you say, is that the things that do take time, you usually can do at the end of your turn, like uh, completing those contracts or is a free action. Everything that you do, you place your dice, you take your action, it's the next player's turn, that's it. But there's a bunch of these free actions that you can do, but normally there's very few that you need to take at the beginning in order to enhance that particular turn, but most of them you take at the end. So you can just say, that's what I'm doing, I'm going to be doing this as well, but go ahead, and then, you know, the flow of the game continues, you know, you trade in your resources, you complete that contract but the other person's already done their turn and it's almost your turn again already so that's what i really like about the game as well like you said flows well and unlike a lot of other euros of this weight and a lot, unlike a lot of other euros that involve resource manipulation of this of this sort it's definitely more it feels more focused again despite the large number of details that are going on it's there's a lot of stuff to process on the map but it's relatively focused. You earn points, largely speaking, in two ways. You complete contracts and you travel to places. That's more or less it. And as a result, you can really look at the contracts that you have available and say, okay, what do I need to do to satisfy these contracts? I've talked about this before in the context of other heroes. If they're implicated well, I really like it when a game can give you short-term goals that are easy to process and give you something to aim towards, even in a larger system. And although the system of Marco of Voyages of Marco Polo is somewhat lar larger, you always have some sort of short-term goal to work towards. And so you never really get lost in the weeds. Now, what separates a beginning player from an expert player is precisely Precisely the player who can look at the board at the start of the game and say, I think I know where I need to go, broadly speaking. But even if you're a new player, you can look down at your board and say, okay, here's my contract. I need to get these things, and that's what I'm going to do. And so it really does, it helps with the, the speed of the turns, it helps with the flow, but it also really all, always gives you some sort of notion about where you're going. And so you're not going to get lost in the details. Yeah, it has that element of games that I like. It's the order of importance. Because even though people can't steal spaces from you, but in order for you to, to do all the actions that you want to do with the resources you have now without having to get more resources because you're hitting these action spaces later, you can say, well, I need to take that one now before it's taken. And then this one is least important. I can leave that to the end or I want to do that at the end. That's, I'm finding that's what I really enjoy about games is figuring out what is the most important action that I need to take now and what I can leave to the end. And for a game that doesn't look like it's going to have much player interaction at all, there's actually a, a, a decent amount. I would say it's slightly better than Feast for Odin, which I realize is damning with faint plays, praise because I previously criticized Feast for Odin for not having enough player interaction. But the way that the, again, the board opens up new action spaces that you might be in competition with for other players, the way that there are first arrival bonuses in a variety of spots on the board, and the way that in this sense of prioritization, if you show up second to an action space, you might have to spend more of your precious, precious money. That can be a really big deal. And the limited black dice. There's black dice 
that you can buy. There's a limited number, so you got to get those bought before the other players do as well. Let's talk about just the worker placement. Let's just keep on that for one second. I just want to talk about how unique it is and the fact, because we already sort of hinted at the fact that once you've placed dice somewhere, that place isn't taken. That so you can other people can still go there, and like you said, you just need to throw money at it. So you're going to put your dice there, and then you're just going to have to pay. I'm not going to go to in what you have to pay, but you just have to pay money in order to be the second, third, or fourth person there. And I think it's a great mechanism. Just the fact that you know you're not locked out, you can still do it. It's just going to cost you more resources resources than you thought. It's great because money is so tight. If money were a little bit looser, again to draw the comparison with Feast for Odin, then it wouldn't feel as as important because you usually have enough cash to throw away at, at Feast for Odin to get whatever you need. But in the Voyages of Marco Polo. It is really expensive to travel, and that's more or less half the game. And so every time you have to pay to place anywhere, this, that, that basically means you're paying a huge opportunity cost in almost all instances. And so you really feel it. All right, special abilities. Super game-breaking, but all of them are, much like Blood Rage, much like all these other games that we talk about that have you know insane card abilities. They're all so insane that it just balances the game out. I think it's actually stronger than in Blood Rage, to be honest. For sure. Just to give you... So at the start of the game, everyone drafts one. And just to give you a sense, and you don't even need to know much about how the game works in order to understand how amazing this is. For example, there is one special power that says you don't ever roll your dice. You always just say what the value of the die is. And again, I don't need to tell you the rules for you to understand how amazing that is. We've already told you enough about the tremendous opportunity cost of paying money for going second. Another one of the powers is you never pay money for going second, third, or fourth uh, in a a given space. That is also huge. And generally speaking, so there's one one or two that rely on expansion modules that I'm not huge fans of. More on that later. But other than that, other than the ones that rely on, on extra bits that I'm not a huge fan of, I've found all of the different special powers to be really fun and interesting. They don't straightjacket you. They don't tell you how you are going to play the game because none of them are really about, well, you're going to be ignoring contracts or none of them are going to be about, well, you're not really going to be traveling this game. They're all about ways to overcome a number of the very, very uh, stringent obstacles that you face. And so in a tight game, it gives you one avenue of looseness or freedom or flexibility. And so they're just fun to play with. And I love seeing the new ones that come out and watching people have these little aha moments where they realize how to use them. It's a great element and it's really, really salient because of just how incredibly strong they are. That's, that last part is odd because I have the, under one of my bad points, I have the opposite. Oh, I, really? I have player power and board setup can dictate your gameplay. Really? So how, so give me, give me a for instance in the context of player powers. Well, the, 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 in order to place all these trading houses out, you actually have to end your movement in these places. Sure. There is one of the one of the guys out there that can breeze through and and place his trading houses just as he goes through. So that particular player is going to be moving a lot more than other players, I feel. And Marco Polo himself, he gets a contract every turn, so he's going to be concentrating on contracts maybe more. I, I think if you do not take advantage of these special powers because they're so powerful, I think you're definitely going to be behind the eight ball. Then there is the other special power where every time someone takes a trade good trade goods of any kind, you're going to get one of that kind. That person also leans you towards doing contracts. Yes, but given that everyone... I have yet to see a game where... Anyone, not even just the successful players, or anyone largely ignored either of those two avenues. Yes, some people focus more on contracts. Yes, some people focus more on travel. But for example, just to take one of your examples, the, uh, the, the power that lets you drop trading houses en route. Last game we played, I can definitely think about how that would have gotten me lots more points without even having changed my play. And so that, I think that's an instance of just demonstrating that it's not straightjacketing you. If, I, if the way I just happened to be playing with another power that was completely different from that would have benefited tremendously from that power and would have given me an advantage. Now, maybe that's just to say that the powers don't influence your play as much as you might have thought they were. But I really do think that it's a fun thing you can exploit, but I don't think it's telling you the way you have to play. Not I mean, have to, but I'm saying it, it does steer you in a direction. Fair enough. I, I'll, I'll freely grant that. But I mean, essentially, one of the things that I like about the Voyages of Marco Polo is basically there are two things you are doing. For all the details here, for all the different kinds of resources, for all the different kinds of action spaces, for all those different kinds of forward plans you can make, you're basically getting points from two things, voyaging and contract. So True. The, so there's, the fact there's, that, n- there's no real direction for them to steer you. Agreed. But 
but for the way you play, you, you might you might not have a certain style that you play. But if you don't take advantage of this particular thing, you might be it might be to your detriment. Fair enough. Shall we talk about the expansions? Yes, let's talk about the expansions. So there have been three, two two small promo ish level expansions, and one that was a, a bigger box. There was one released the same year as the game, and it was called The New Characters, and as you can obviously infer from that, it involves a bunch of new characters, new special powers that you can play with. That one, I think, is great. More special powers is wonderful, because, again, even even though you're not a huge fan of all the implications, I think you do like seeing the new toys. Yeah, for sure. The second small one, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the big box one because we'll talk a little bit more about that in depth. It's called The Secret Paths of Marco Polo. It involves a couple new characters and a minor new Benny for one of the characters. Basically, it, it, it's a deck of cards that says, while you have this card, these two adja- these two cities account as adjacent for you, so they help you travel a little bit. Yeah, here I have shortcuts. Bah. <laughs> because I really feel that the constraints of the map is part of the game. Sure. And even though, you know, while we were playing that, I thought, you know, it would be really awesome if I could, you know, cr- cut across this huge impasse and it would, you know, I think that's part of the game. So I, I'm not a fan of the shortcuts. That's fair. But and, and saying it this way really makes it sound like I, I, I don't enjoy Voyages of Marco Polo, which is strange because I really do. Basically, anytime you're playing, you're facing a set of constraints and many of the powers more or less say this constraint either doesn't apply to you or is very significantly altered. Like the guy who never who never has to roll dice, just stipulates what the dice are. The values on your dice are a constraint of the game. It's baked into the game system. This one character says you ignore that constraint. Paying for going in later placements is a constraint on the game. And one of the characters says you ignore that constraint. So to a certain extent, I, I see it very much as, as, as part of that, that element. It's like, this is, everybody has the following binds, you have one bind removed from you. So, do you have the same impression with respect to these other characters? No, that's... Okay, it's just, this is one constraint that you don't like seeing lifted at all. That's right. Fair enough, I can see that. Anyway, and then there's the big box expansion, well, big for an an expansion anyway. It was the, uh, the box expansion, Agents of Venice, which it includes, broadly speaking, three things. There's a new sideboard where you can place trading houses in Venice, which is your starting city, and not just all over places like Moscow and Kashgar and, and Beijing. It includes a variety of new characters and new contracts, and it includes this uh, module called the Agents of Venice, where you can recruit new agents. And I'll say right off the top that the new characters... And the new contracts and things like that, I'm definitely a fan of. They add to the variety. The The additional rules overhead is borderline trivial because you just explain it once when they first hit the table. Everyone's got their special power. They all go off to the races. The other two I've got somewhat mixed feelings about. How do you feel about the expansion material? Well, we talked about it as well. There's this One of the expansions is this whole line of extra actions that you can take along the bottom. So you place a die at the bottom. You have this new uh, agent. agent that's going to you know, give you an advantage for that turn. So when they come out, you have to explain what they all are. At the end of the round, you have to collect them all back in, shuffle them all up again, place them back out again. It just seems like too much for too little. Yeah, it is. It disrupts the flow. It it practically increases the setup round by round by a third all by itself. Because again, normally all you have to do is just take all the dice, get your income, which is relatively modest, and then put out new contracts. And here you have to reshuffle and deal out the the agents and explain what all the agents do, because it's a fair number and it's not easy to remember. And so, yeah, I agree. I don't really think it... The the amount of of goodness it adds to the game is relatively modest, but the amount of information load is is relatively considerable. So I agree with you. I don't think I'm going to be playing with the agents anymore. And which in turn gets rid of one of the characters, because one of the characters relies on the agents, but that's fine. You're still going to have lots of characters to deal with after that. And then there's the Venice board. What do you think about the Venice board? Uh, I, I could take it or leave it. I think that if you, I think for people that play Marco Polo a lot, it's a nice addition. It, it opens up the game. It lets you uh, move a lot more, you know, expand a lot faster. It gives you more places to put trading huts, but it, it gives you more, more uh, trading houses to put out. So the point I have here is that you are forced to use this module. Like if it's out, like like some additions you get that you say, oh, I'm just not going to concentrate on that. I'll just, you know, do my normally 
a thing that I do over here and, you know, everyone else can use the expansion stuff. That's okay. But in this one, you're forced because you're given, you're given four extra houses and if you, and no one else is, so you have to try to get rid of these four extra houses. So, and it's a lot easier to get them over on the expansion board than it is to try to, you know, travel around even more on the main board to try to get rid of them that way. Forced, I think is far, far, far too strong. I'm going to have to disagree with you there because so first of all, it is worth noting, uh, the Venice board does allow you to play with up to five players. And if you're playing with five players, you are obliged to use the Venice board. And I think that really goes to show that it makes the game, the, the, the game board more open. It gives it, it, it releases some of the constraints and the tightness in the game uh, more on that in just half a second. But with respect to whether or not you're forced, you're obliged to take advantage of the Venice board. If you plan on getting the bonus points for putting out all your houses, but that's not something you have to do. In all the games I've played, I've only ever gotten those bonuses once. Well, that's what I'm saying. Say if, if even, and that's even not using the expansion all the time. So that's four less trading houses that you have to put out. Now that you have four more and you don't feel like using the expansion, now it's almost impossible for you to do that. Sure. So if it is the case that your focus is going to be on putting out all your trading houses and the, the Venice board is in play, then yes, you do have to pay attention to that additional place to place houses. I don't see that as a huge problem, though. Because if, you, if your drive is to place out a whole bunch of places, uh, uh, houses, and the board puts, gives you more places to put houses, then yeah, you pay attention to where you can put houses. I, I fail to see the difficulty. I'm just saying, you're, if, if that's part of your normal strategy is to get all your houses out, then you're obliged to use the expansion, even if you do or do not want to. That's all I was saying. Well, but you're not obli- so obliged to use the expansion if you are including it in the game setup. Yes. It, it's just it's an aspect of the board you can't afford to ignore. It's that's not right. that, it's not right. that mo- once Sorry. the component has entered no, no, your no, life, no, you're forced not... to set it up every time. No, that is not. Or the Marco not... Polo police are going to come. That is not what I'm saying. And, and, and rend- rend- render you not to Asia. Not at all. Yeah, okay. I'm saying if it, it, if it is expansion that you're using, then you are... F- not, I guess forced is strong. You are fairly obliged to pay attention to that board because yes. if you just let it go, there it's almost impossible to get all your trading houses out. I I think at the end of the day, I'm mostly with you with respect to the uh, the Venice board. I would I could take or leave it because without the Venice board, everything is really tight. Uh, with the Venice board, things are still tight, but they are a little less tight. It's not like you're going to be drowning in more money, for example, but the pressure to get early income is going to be a little bit alleviated because it's a little bit cheaper to travel on the Venice board. And so you might be able to go and do that. It's just a cheaper place to travel for a little bit if that's all you want to do. And normally travel is is very, very expensive. So if you're in the mood for uh, a more resource tight experience, you know, it's, it's the classic Agricola versus Caverna issue. Like how tight do you want your, your resources to be? That's true. And I do like how tight they are in the base game. So, I mean, I'm always going to include as many of the new characters as I possibly can, because even the ones, some of them even, and again, this I think is just how good the information management is much of the time. Some of the new characters in Marco Polo introduce their own sub-mechanism, their own unique either deck of cards or their own unique stack of tiles. And they're fine. The The information load is minimal. The component load is minimal. And it's very, very easy to deal with even if you're playing for your first time. Com- contrast this, of course, to what we've talked about, the agents, where it really is, we think, more fiddle than it's worth. Or other things, It's it, 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 it just doesn't it just isn't worth it. But that's just a testament to how good the information management is much of the time. The iconography isn't the best, but it's usually good enough that you can give people a general overview and they'll understand how it works. And again, this is one of the ways in which I, I thought I was pretty much done with new uh, middleweight-ish resource management euros, especially if they had any kind of worker placement adjacent mechanism. It's one of the reasons why I was so pleasantly surprised by the voyages of Marco Polo, because I was expecting it to be just another thing in a long line of a very crowded genre. But in part because of how focused it is, it manages to maintain focus even with all this element of detail. That, that That's one of the reasons why I like it so much. And then you, when you add the redonkulous special characters on top of that, that makes every game uh, different to play and lets you wrestle with a slightly different engine. I really do find uh, Marco Polo to be uh, a delight. Yeah, and the fact that we talk about all the different spaces that they're actually a deck of cards that are are double the size of that there are spaces. I don't know that didn't come out right, but but you're putting them out randomly every turn, and when you're done every putting game. them out, 
you still have a deck that's large enough to put, cover another entire board if you need to. And that's just the extra action spaces. And then there's the spaces we talked about where you get your extra bonus every turn. These are these blue spaces, and they're, they're those are going to be randomized across the board every time as well. So it, it makes for a different experience every time. So the replay, replayability is huge in this game. The replayability is very nice. The information load is very nice. It's not, I don't think, I think it's fair to say it's not revolutionary in anything. Dice placement has been done a bunch of times before. Its approach to dice placement is very pleasant, and I enjoy all my playings. I think uh, this is a great sort of middleweight Euro game for the sort of jaded Euro gamer who who thinks they might be done with uh, worker placement or games of this sort, because to me at least, I found it a very, very welcome change of pace uh, and a very, very pleasant diversion. All right, I pretty well hit all my points. I have one left. What do you have left? All that I have left is to hear your marvelous dulcet tones extol your final point to us. I, I think my final point was uh, theme. So what? <laughs> Fair enough. And the fact that there's, if you're looking for a game full of theme, it is not in this game. But I am shocked, shocked to hear that this like, middleweight resource management euro has no theme. But like I said, it, it doesn't need. It, it could be worse. I mean, you are. That's what I'm you, saying. You are at least marching your dudes to to establish trade routes with Asia. It, that's, that's what I'm, something. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't detract from the game i don't think and i think if you change the theme to something else it wouldn't add anything to the game what about delivering cows to alien overlords well that goes without saying (laughs) (laughs) anyway i don't think the voyages of marco polo is going to set the world on fire but i've been having a good time with it and i really do appreciate the variety and they did a number of clever things so insofar as you are looking for uh, a new Euro Horizon and you're a little bit sick to death of all the incredibly generic and uh, incredibly lazy worker placement stuff out there, I think you might enjoy The Voyages of Marco Polo as I do. With that in mind, Walker has begun shaking his head dejectedly, which means that it's time for Walker's Top 10. All right, so I had this massive reasoning of this top 10 list, i.e. if it was a time capsule, if I was stranded on a desert island... If I had to take games to Mars and start a new colony, but it all boils down to this. If I had to reduce my current game collection to 10 games, and I could be 100% selfish with it, i.e. I don't care about the other groups, I don't care about uh, player count, I don't care about the different groups I go to, or games that people like, if I was completely selfish and could only keep 10 games... These are the games that I would keep. Wait, I have to imagine that you're completely selfish? Yeah. I'm, and that you don't care about other... Wait, I, I, I don't know. That, oh. This is the only way I could make this list. Can I turn invisible in this alternate reality? or You can try. <laughs> so let's just get Tigers and Euphrates out of the way. Obviously, we've <laughs> talked about it enough. Fantastic game. Tigers and Euphrates, Tile Lane, fantastic. Force your opponent to do what you want him to do. Game. We've talked about it enough. Let's move on to the next one. Scythe. Really? I love Scythe. I love the fact that you can play so many different ways. You can, you know, try to do an economic engine. You can do try to do a combat engine that mixes it up. You can get a different faction and a different, uh, you know, government every time. It uh, The miniatures are great. The components are fantastic. The additions, you know, you know, some are great, some are bad, however you did. I think they all added something to it. None of them were terrible, I don't think. More on that later, I'm sure, in a, in a, in a further episode. And that's Scythe. You know, I always suspected, deep in my cynical little heart, that whenever I voiced my misgivings about Scythe for why I thought it wasn't a top-tier game, and you said, yeah, that's true, I suspected you were just patronizing me. Look, these aren't these aren't the best games. These aren't the best mechanical games. Like I said, sure. these are for selfish reasons sure. that I would keep, because I just really enjoy playing them. Fair enough. Next up. These are in no current order, and in particular order, I should say. Space Hulk. Space Hulk I'd keep for multiple reasons, not only because I think it's a fantastic game, and I think it's aged fine. Uh, it was like one of the first major uh, games that I got, other than, you know, like a Monopoly or, a, or Axe and Allies or whatever, and I still think it lives up. The theme is all there, and I think it plays great. We've talked about it before. I'm just going to disagree with you on one point. I don't think it's aged fine. I think it's aged beautifully. Sorry. I think most of the other quote-unquote evolutions on the genre have just, you know, complicated it for no good reason. Especially when you compare it to 
uh, current and or past Games Workshop games. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that's Space Hulk. Next up is a game that I enjoy it more and more every time I play it, and that is Gaia Project. I think that this is a game that I'll have for a very long time. It has multiple alien powers. It's the the sister of Terra Mystica that... And the fact that they're both in the top 10 on BGG is sort of a testament to how other people view it. Oh, don't pull that. We we both crap on other games in the top 10, and you know it. <laughs> no, I just had to sure, throw sure. that in for particular reasons. It, it'll, I'm sure it'll overcome, like, as soon as people, more uh, Terra Mystica people play uh, Gaia Project and then ultimately get rid of their Terra Mystica because it's now a pointless, redundant piece of cardboard <laughs> no, so, some people look some people do prefer terra mystica i'm not one of those people but some people still prefer it. some people could be wrong yeah i know many people can be wrong next up is orleans it's a bag building game the fact that you can play it cooperatively you can play it solo you can play it competitively and i think i shouldn't say any much about the the co- the solo mode because i haven't actually played it the fact that there's so many different buildings and you can create completely different engines each time i know it all results in the same outcome of moving your guys around and you know getting to the same point but how you get there can be so different every time i really enjoy orleans next up game (laughs) that probably people have heard of but will have no idea level seven invasion really yes if you can think of another dudes on a map heavy plastic completely cooperative game I can't think of any. Point taken. This is everything you want, you know, like a big risk or axe and allies game to be, but it's cooperative. It's got a mechanism that when I was thinking about something that I've always wanted, like in a combat game where you can upgrade skills of certain combat units, you know, slowly upgrade them over time. This has it, you know, you, you're, you're not only upgrading your units, you're upgrading your, your uh, defenses and your political system and your... It's. Uh, I think it's a. I think it's a very underrated game. I. I don't think it's one of these games that you know you play every week or whatever. But it's one of these fantastic games that you bring out once or twice a year, and everyone seems to have a great time. I should really give it a try. I've never played it. Level seven invasion by Privateer Press. Next up, Diplomacy. It is a staple. It is simplistic. It has, if you go through so many other games, how old it is, how how many other games have pulled devices from Diplomacy, the fact that it's just support and attack, one piece per area, and uh, the written orders and the shenanigans you can get into by deceiving people and purposely flubbing your orders or... or saying that you misheard or or just just the overall fun of diplomacy just makes it one of the greatest games ever made in my opinion i i would have to diplomacy is probably right up there for me with chess and go in terms of games that are really excellent and can't be faulted but uh, that i don't want to play but that i think is you know truly rarefied company i i absolutely agree with you diplomacy is a timeless classic next up hansa Titanica. the flow in this game is real all right, two actions, it does, you know, what you need to do, and there's no upkeep, you know, you know, minimal upkeep between turns, like there's some, you know, re-putting out little chits, but other than that, it's two actions go, two actions go, and the level of depth, and like I talked about before, uh, doing doing actions that need to be done immediately while reserving other actions to later, like knowing what your priority is right now and what is best going to benefit you at that moment and utilizing that particular action is what i love that is why hansa Tatanka is on this list another great game for people who are jaded of euro games who think they're all the same and or who, for people who think that euro games never have enough player interaction here's a game that is hansa Tatanka really in a lot of ways stands by itself as being as feeling and acting really differently from a lot of other euro placement games and the player interaction is constant and it is vicious and it is really, really interesting in a lot of different ways. And there's so many ways to, 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 to deal with it. Talked about Hans Teutonica, I believe, in our second episode ever. And I agree with you, Hans Teutonica truly is amazing. Next up is Kemet. It's got fantastic figures. 
I love the the abilities. You get to buy the different colored abilities. The fact that it changes uh, the way you play every game. You can just say, I'm going to go for this pyramid. Now there's even going to be yet another color purple pyramid, which is going to change once again, a whole new different way to play. The fact that everyone's starting area is the same number of spaces away from everybody else. The fact that it has this battle card system, the same as uh, uh, Game of Thrones and other places where, you know, you have a set of cards and you're going to play them out until they're all gone and then you get them all back so you know what people have left. You can sort of suss out how the battle's going to go, but there's always that one chance that some craziness will happen. That is Kemet by Madagot Games. Last up, but not least, Axes and Allies 1914. Okay, so this is the World War I version World of War I of Axe and Allies. I cannot deny that I am an old school dudes on a map game with lots of dice chucking and the way that this game puts combined arms together and the way the map is laid out and the way it sort of represents how World War I started and the advantages you get for this combined arms, how it all works together and still gives you that same Axe and Allies, you know, just the typical, you know, mashing armies together. I still love it. Axe and Allies, 1914. And it's because of that combined arms element that you prefer 1914 to the other iterations? For sure. Okay. And it's like, my, well, because it's, it's by far the newest, you know, edition, you know, all Is the, it? well, I'm, you know, other versions of Axe and Allies have come out like reprints. But for like a totally new version of Axe and Allies, this is the newest one. So it's a lot more streamlined, a lot more, you know, the rules are laid out better. You know, that is until Axe and Allies Zombies comes out. And I'm sure that will, you know. Let's just say that one of us is more enthusiastic about that game than the other of us. (laughs) No, I don't think. I I think you've got that wrong. I think I know exactly what it's going to be. (laughs) But I'm still going to love playing it for that one. Let me put it this way then. One of us cares when it comes out and is look, and and is seeking to acquire it in some way one of for us that, is not for that one and only play yes so just out of curiosity because again i'm trying to uh I'm, I'm getting this fascinating vision of of you some of this is is as i expected but some of it is surprising uh thematically speaking what era appeals to you more world war one games or world war two games because this because we now have two game systems one of which i like but both of which you like we have the quartermaster general system which has you know both world wars and, and indeed a couple of others that are that that it seeks to emulate and similarly in axis and allies it's got several visions of world war ii because there's guadalcanal as well as i as i understand it uh and the pacific version and then there's the normal version in 1914 and so forth but do you have a, a, a particular affinity for either of these settings no, or? I, I, I can't say just for different reasons i like world war ii because there's so much information so much history so much programming on it that you know so much about it and world war one is slightly the opposite there's not much, you know, of course there's tons on it, but it was such yeah, so it's, long it's, ago. Yeah, it's less part of popular it's, consciousness, absolutely. And that, not only that, but there's just less written about it. You know, I mean, there, there was, wasn't the mass media that there was, there wasn't television, there wasn't film, there wasn't, you know, what, what there was during World War II. So I'm very interested in playing World War One games because there a lot of them have these facts that I didn't even know about the first time. Or even when I pl- when I read the rules for for uh, Axe and Eyes 1914, I'd go online, I watched you know tons of videos to get all of this history, you know, so I could, you know, why you know why do they set it up this way or why you know do they get this many troops right and and finding out this new information is why I like World War One and like I said I like World War Two because there is I know already so much about it and I enjoy replaying those. I have to get you in front of GMT games. I really like. <laughs> there's, I don't know. You could I, play an actual war game, Walker, and <laughs> I, if, I, if I can get by the mustard yellow, teal, red, stark blue covers, you know, I, I maybe because if there's one thing we know that you need to have in a game of World War One, it's visual jazz. <laughs> it's so tr- brightly colored. But it's just so. I, I, yeah, well, that's that's another conversation. I'm sure it's just that I've had so many bad experiences with certain GMT games that name you know, one through the desert, not through the desert. What's what are you the, talking? No, no, not through the desert. What's that one that uh, Rommel in the desert? No, because that was Colombia. The one on the Afghanistan. Oh, a distant plane. A distant plane. Yeah. Okay. The coin games are bad. See, the, the problem is you've been led astray. You, 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 you've been shown GMT games by people with bad taste because yeah, the coin games are are, are not good. And then the other one. And I haven't played it. So this is a totally... <laughs> you haven't played it, I was sure. going to say, um, t- this is totally an illegitimate complaint and totally going to get flack on it. But the fact that Twilight Struggle was so long at number one just bothered me. Why? Because it's such an ugly game and it's such about... And I've already <laughs> talked about... Just a moment. And I've already talked about the fact that 
the Cold War does nothing for me and the fact that the game so much relies on you knowing exactly what's coming up in your deck and what cards you have to prepare for. I I just didn't like that whole mechanism. So I had this, you know, weird affinity for, for Twilight Struggle. So that's two GMT games that sort of throw me off the whole genre. Oh, wow. But I've played other ones. Like you said, Dominant Species, Love Dominant Species. Not really not really a GMT game. Oh, why, why are people bringing it up as GMT then? Well, no, it's published by GMT, but it's not a war game. It's, it's, it's a... I'm sure there's other ones I've played as well. Okay, fine. Anyway, getting a little bit off topic. Yes. <laughs> Just cut that whole last part out. No, I don't think I will. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been very illuminating. Thank you very, very much for uh, submitting to the to, to the format. I hope that uh, viewers, the viewers who've been clamoring for it, will be able to get some degree of insight into the madness and the genius and the beauty that is Michael Walker from that. And uh, I realize it was very painful, but uh, we're not really going to have to do anything remotely resembling a top ten list ever again, at least until we do our year in review episode. But there, you don't seem to object to it as much. No, well, it's because it's. The games we like for that year, and there's usually not that many nowadays, especially this year. Just Yeah, n- hardly any games released this year, it's true. Yeah. So that's going to close it out for us today. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter, at the games you like. Feel free to ask for our top tens, and we will tell you to just listen to the podcast. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, where you can tell everyone in the world how much you hate us. Or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, in which case you can tell a subset of people that you hate us, which is guild number 3236. We read absolutely everything you send us because we are masochists who hate ourselves, and we will get back to you if we can because we are sadists who like to inflict pain on others. Thanks again very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. And by soon, I mean next week because we're back on a regular schedule. Because we hate you. Take care, everyone. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>